I wonder how many people <coughs> from the undifferentiated public would understand 50 per cent of what was said this morning. If they did understand it, would they care? And if they don't care, might they get to the point with a populist politician who says to them, all this is talk or all this is kind of activity that really isn't in your interests in wherever you might live in Australia? It is possible, of course, for the story of the operations that have been the subject of conversation this morning uh, to be lost on the public, who in the end pay for them. And so the conversation that we're going to have with our panel at this part of the program is an attempt to talk about the way in which we bring the Australian people into the conversation about literal operations and perhaps, if it's the case in Australia, that the politicians say, these are our people, quick, we better get in front of them. It may be that public opinion might lead political will, that people think that these operations are good and worthy of their taxes. Our three panellists today uh, Commander Fenn Kemp, who will talk about the Navy's own efforts to tell its own story. Our good friend Lieutenant Colonel Mike Harris, who will talk about how the Army sees it, because it has skin in this game as well. And then finally, Cameron Stewart from the Australian newspaper. And I'll particularly be asking him questions about how he takes good news stories that the Navy and the Army uh, might produce and get them into his paper when perhaps the editor would rather just hear about the things that have gone wrong and the things that certainly aren't right. So would you please join with me first in welcoming Commander Fenkamp. Well, uh, uh, Vice Admiral Jones, uh, Rear Admiral Goldrick, sirs, ma'ams, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues up the back there, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, we don't often get such a grand scale for public affairs and for Navy communications, and we're very appreciative of this chance to talk with you and to share your thoughts as well as just me downloading on you. Um, my presentation today will attempt to give a general overview of how we're tracking in the selling the littoral, selling the amphibious space. Uh, I think the news is overall quite positive, but we will need to think differently, I think, on how we sell the littoral if we are to properly engage with our customers. So this is basically what we'll be up to, um, what we're selling, because I think for various parts of the audience what we're selling varies, uh, who the customer is, and it's not as simple as you may think. How have we gone so far, and any lessons we may have learnt. Defining a concept, which is typical of your Navy brief, I think it's pretty obvious for everyone in this room, we're going to basic, basically talk about amphibious, which for some may be a little too narrow, but from a selling the littoral perspective, amphibious is the best we can do. And that's actually a very hard sell, because the problem is littoral uh, means different things to different groups. And for the public, uh, a reference to amphibious warfare conjures up images of uh, Normandy landings. Uh, indeed, during the initial planning for the LHDs, the uh, Australian Naval Institute uh, suggested the names HMAS Gallipoli, HMAS Guadalcanal could be used, and I should pay tribute there to my friend and colleague Paul Garay in the audience who came up with that suggestion and I think in hindsight it would have been an absolutely fantastically innovative decision to, to make but uh, we decided to stick with tradition uh, in our single service way. Um, as well as the historic of course we have the humanitarian aspect and we've heard a lot of that through Captain uh, Saunter's uh, discussion today uh, and the J3. And HADR, as we'll see later, is an easy selling point and a valuable one among other agencies and government, but it sometimes can be a distraction to our own people uh, who need to be focused on how to manage the littoral in a potential warfare scenario. So the challenge for us all is, is to pin the customer down. Who is the customer? Is it the sailor on the amphibious vessel? Uh, is it the soldier on the beach? Is it the flight controller or is it uh, the civilian watching TV? It is, of course, all of these. So I propose we break key audiences down into three groups. The domestic, the internal and the regional. And I'll leave the regional aspect uh, to Lieutenant Colonel Harris after I speak. But let me focus first on the first two, the uh, domestic and the internal. And this, of course, is the main effort we put into, and it's selling to a domestic audience. Uh, it makes sense. I mean, the Australian taxpayer paid about $3.1 billion for each of them. 
um, we owe something in return. Uh, we have, in effect, a contract with the Australian people to justify not just our expenditure, but the activities and operations we participate in under their name. A recent domestic tour of HMAS Adelaide, for example, was very successful. Everywhere the LHD went, she drew large crowds. Uh, in Adelaide, the crowd was capped at about 5,000. I say capped because this was a ticketed event, unlike our normal open days, and it sold out in days, two weeks in fact, before the ship arrived. During HMAS Adelaide's visit to Brisbane, our messaging campaign was even more successful. She was carrying uh, Australian and US Army personnel to exercise Hamel. So we were able to introduce the actual amphibious nature of the capability to a domestic audience. And the visuals were perfect. A major media event was conducted on board, a joint capability was displayed to that media audience. The ship's company also participated in the freedom of entry parade and the obligatory open day. At each stop, our message has been, look at this large, impressive capability. The words adaptable appeared a lot in the local media. At each port, the CO described the ship as the Swiss army knife of capability. And while there is not always a special mention to the amphibious as a concept, that's all the general public wanted to hear. Here is a modern, capable, flexible, floating city. Job done. And if the taxpayer is happy, then so are our politicians. Attention, all personnel. This is a test of the base-wide <laughs> alert system. No action is required. I repeat, no action is required. Okay. Here come the noise, of course. Here we go. So look. Yeah. You can cut this out of the video at the end, Andrew, can't you? Good, that's good. No jump cuts. All right, all right. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be more than just disperse. Okay, so we were talking about general messaging to a domestic audience. <laughs> What's this one? <laughs> OK. So from a domestic perspective, the messaging has to remain general. That's frankly all the public want to know. Anything more complex than this is a floating city and it's powerful enough to power up Darwin in a day is completely lost on the average taxpayer. So the public interest is uh, not only um, in numbers on, the, uh, on open days, it's also on Navy Daily, on Navy social media platforms, which are very active. Uh, in fact, there are significant spikes each time an LHD or anything amphibious is featured. It's a similar story on the Army's website. Um, Air Force, not so much. It's not quite as much of a, a priority at the moment, but that will change, I'm sure. But the bottom line is, how much does this general messaging help us sell the littoral as a concept? Selling the littoral to our own people, and by that I mean defence and related agencies in general, requires a different and I believe a more tailored approach. In August, CN addressed the Williams Foundation and what he said, I believe, sums up how well we need to sell or how we need to sell the amphibious message. The nature of warfare has changed and we need to change with it or suffer the consequences. That message resonates with us all no matter what uniform we wear. For Navy, it means focusing on the jointery, if that's a word, and complexity of warfare, and less on the individual ship deployments, which we are all used to. For Army, it means changing tactics, reviewing logistics, understanding that ships are no longer for transportation alone, and some would argue they never were. And for Air Force, the messaging is similar to that of Navy. The days of operating in isolation are over, and I think RAF's plan Jericho makes that very clear. 
The underlining priority of Jericho is to create a truly joint force. And as we operate in a defence force still dominated by single service priorities, however, that message can lose traction. A search of defence newspapers uh, since the start of the year shows surprisingly that, Navy, not surprisingly, that Navy's amphibious message uh, is covered almost on every uh, um, uh, edition. The LHD is key f front page on every story. Army has just one major amphibious feature that I was able to find and I couldn't find any for the RAF on the front page. I'm not going further than that for this purpose, but um, clearly, and again, we're seeing this from a single service perspective here um, because we're single service driven and our newspapers are single service as well. And I think also we have to keep in mind that um, other agencies matter. Um, DFAT in particular has been extremely engaged, as we heard from Commodore Bannister, in, uh, in being engaged in introducing its staff to the LHDs, particularly from that LH, um, HADR perspective. The illustration at the top left is a DFAT group visiting HMAS Adelaide at Garden Island very recently. Uh, a DFAT representative was also present on board uh, during Operation Fiji Assist, as we heard. In fact, I think you said two, sir. And, uh, also on USS Blue Ridge during uh, Talisman Sabre 15. So DFAT's involvement represents a very positive step in selling the humanitarian aspect of the amphibious capability. These internal engagements are being embraced by other agencies uh, who now have a greater understanding of what can be achieved in this space. In fact, if I can just digress from a script, I happen to be um, married to a DFAT officer and I'm living at the moment in Jakarta um, at the embassy. And the interest in what we do in the amphibious space has gone from curiosity to interest. Uh, when a position is advertised for Talisman Sabre 17, um, it has been openly discussed now of actually an opportunity for some of the younger DFATers to, to uh, get some experience on it. So it's not just something those weird Navy people do, it's now actually of interest to DFAT. And I think that's a huge step forward in language and, uh, and that's a credit to how we sell as well. So when selling the, the actual littoral warfare concept, there's no fewer more valuable ways to do it, of course, than exercises such as RIMPAC. Now, RIMPAC provides us with the opportunity to sell the littoral to both that domestic and internal audience. HMAS Canberra was a RIMPAC this year for the first time. Her presence was a golden opportunity, which the HQ Jock Public Affairs team embraced wholeheartedly. And I should recognise one of them in the audience, uh, Lieutenant Commander Pete Croce, who was one of the team uh, over there this year. And as part of the littoral task group, a three-day HADR exercise validated a number of proficiencies involving Canberra. She was then very busy validating a number of um, US helicopters and waterborne craft and landing uh, either on the flight deck or inside the well dock of the LHD. Later in the exercise, the mandatory uh, beach assault was wrapped up, uh, the LHD's involvement in the exercise, and all of these evolutions were covered by our PA effort with proactive stories, imagery and video. And the figures, I have to say, are very impressive. Directly posting to the ADF on Operations and Exercises Facebook site, that's the Jock Facebook site, from location on a daily basis, showed an increase over the course of the exercise from about 17,900 to 20,300 subscribers. And a jump like that is quite significant in social media terms. Daily posts of product on the site saw an audience of about 960,000 for the duration of the exercise, with video content the most popular. When combined with the Royal Australian Navy, the Australian Army and the Royal Australian Air Force audience figures, the total audience reached about two million people. Uh, a Seven Network reporter also visited the exercise, filing for about a week. Uh, the presence of national or international media is rare at these events because of the cost involved, and you might want to talk to Cameron about the limitations faced by them in covering what we do. It's a regrettable weakness of the littoral selling strategy. We just don't have a budget, and neither do they but this is the best we can do. And I think from the RIMPAC figures at least, those sorts of major hits uh, do a lot in terms of how we sell our littoral capability. Something else happened at RIMPAC too this time around, and this is I think the first time. As you can see from this chart taken from the PA plan that Pete and his gang used, significant efforts were made to include a more tailored message in our own internal publications. This internal conversation document is a relatively new addition to a PA plan, so selling the littoral is showing definite signs of taking on a new level of complexity. This is an acknowledgement that we must sell the littoral to both internal and domestic audiences. 
And the question must now be, is this enough to educate our own people in what is to come in the littoral space? Now, for the small team of PAOs operating at an exercise such as RIMPAC, the answer is yes. Uh, we just don't have the people. But as we wrap up the trial period for the LHDs and our amphibious capability takes on an increased complexity, the question is, what do we do now? Selling the littoral message can't be done properly if it involves all, unless it involves all of those involved. In other words, we need to reach out to every player in the battle space. Our single service tendencies tend to limit our capability. The main selling point must surely be, if you think you can last independently on a littoral battlefield, you won't last long. Stovepiping capabilities will lead to failure. And that's obviously what Polaris, Jericho and Beersheba are selling. But it's the what's in, for me, what's in it for me aspect that tends to get lost. We need strategic corporals, sailors, airmen and women who know their role and understand where they fit in a multi-layered combat environment. At NGN, where I'm doing my work now in internal communications in Navy, we're experimenting with key influencers. They're members, predominantly senior sailors, warrant or officer rank, who are in positions to understand, support and convince others for the need for internal change. Now, this is still a work in progress, but these members effectively act as cultural ambassadors. Perhaps we could use the same approach for the, the, the amphibious space as we attempt to tailor our littoral message. This could be as simple as a joint mission statement, uh, or a road show, or an outreach program to opinion shapers, and perhaps all of the above. And there is the challenge for selling the littoral internally. What, are we dis what we're discussing here, well this is the challenge, what we're discussing here is not operational, but on the other hand not limited to a single service, so we tend to fall between the cracks. This internal push needs to be coordinated by PA professionals from each service, the littoral focuses us more, on, more than ever on the need for a joint PA capability. And I'm talking here about far more than a product collection that JPAU most capably, capably provides. So selling the littoral in general terms to a domestic audience I think remains well on track with key sales pitches represented by the LHD. The, the public interest is there and so far it's been very positive. But to sell the littoral properly, the customer base must be broken down further to include domestic as well as internal and regional stakeholders. From an internal perspective, we're making good progress, but we're only up to the introduction phase. We're effectively just kicking the tyres. We are just coming to terms with a complex task of explaining the what's in it for me. The question which is naturally posed by those who will end up as key players in a littoral campaign. Cultural change of this type, because that's what this is, takes time at least several years. So let's consider new ways of selling the message now. A change in our language and a better understanding of who we're selling it to will help us change our approach. Now, I'll hand over now to Mike, who will talk about the third aspect of our customer base, which is the regional aspect. So, well, Andrew. Uh loads me up. I'd uh, just like to say thank you for uh, being um, allowed to come here and speak to uh, such a, an esteemed audience. Um, it is a privilege for myself uh, and too valuable an opportunity to miss because the challenges we face today regarding how Australia is viewed by our regional neighbours, how we balance our strategic relations without jeopardising um, uh, long-standing bilateral and multilateral political and military commitments and nationally vital uh, trade arrangements as well as other binding international agreements within a region that is maturing both economically, politically, informationally and crucially militarily is as, as much a communication problem as it is a political or military problem. Thank you, Andrew. And um, as uh, uh, Fenn has just mentioned, our sales pitch on the littoral capability, in my view, is certainly currently lacking. The observations I present here come from the unique position occupied by Joint Operations Command, where government direction is put into military action, as we well know. For instance, when ships are force assigned to the Chief of Joint Operations for Exercise Talisman Sabre, troops or troops are required for the training mission in Iraq, or maritime surveillance aircraft are required for search and rescue tasks, my colleagues and I are required uh, to develop and execute a supporting communication strategy to tell the ADF story. Uh, which we should be doing so with the government's master narrative in mind, or else we are likely to be shouting into the wind. 
But to date, if I can be critical of my own capability, um, is that we have not been telling our story that effectively, and when we are, um, it has been, uh, unfortunately, uh, to little effect. And let us not forget uh, the uh, important democratic right and responsibility of the news media to analyse and critique the actions of government and by proxy defence. We cannot think that social media gives us a chance to sidestep our accountability and transparency obligations to the Australian public. Our hard fought for reputation over the last 15 years has been um, uh, uh, too, um, has been, um, is at risk of being too easily lost if we walk this path. And our friends on the media side of the fence are not shy about their views, unfortunately about the shortcomings of uh, my particular community uh, in communications. So for me, the first challenge in telling the ADF story within the context of the littoral is to understand what the government wants of its littoral capability. What are the characteristics uh, of the operating environment? Where do the risks and opportunities lie? And within the lexicon of the joint military appreciation process, what is the context or what comprises the intelligence preparation of the battlefield? In Australia, uh, let, let me just lay that out a little. In Australia, 82% of the population live within 80 kilometres of the sea. In Indonesia, uh, which has the world's longest coastline, two thirds of its people live within 50 kilometres uh, of the coast and three quarters of its cities uh, sit in low-lying areas. Further north, 70% of Malaysia's population lives in cities clustered on the coast of the Malayan Peninsula. Uh, without doubt, our region is dominated by the littoral. It is also interconnected, with only pockets of isolated coastline and far-flung islands in the South Pacific not serviced by GSM mobile phone towers. As one journalist from the press gallery explained to me, there are few places in the world where you can't feed a video story or dial into the internet via a mobile phone. That's the nature of the modern communications environment. Capturing stills, video and audio of disasters and response efforts, of terrorist attacks or security crisis as they unfold, or where powerful images and words can move from the cyclone damaged Coro Island in Fiji to the other side of the world can happen uh, in the instance of the click of a button. An emerging, if not persistent, trend in journalism is that in, these, in the past, these sorts of news stories may not have been able to be told for the lack of communication infrastructure, uh, but they now can be brought to a global, domestic or local audience uh, with uh, the use of a smartphone, simple editing software and a good idea. And we in defence can no longer assume that the conduct of operations will be done far from the eye of the public. Our first assumption must be that our operations will be public knowledge. And if I just show you... Right now... Sorry. This is a live feed, well, it was a recording of Twitter. Just to highlight, at about nine o'clock at night, just how much activity is occurring, um, you know, beyond our, our, our viewpoint. And certainly uh, Twitter um, is a platform uh, that is uh, establishing a new way of, communication, uh, of communicating um, for, the, for the world. And it may not be persistent into the future, but we certainly uh, do see uh, that um, information is moving around far faster than it has ever done before. Within the littoral context of critical importance is that 70% of the world's population, eight out of 10 countries and virtually all centres of international trade are in littoral regions. Among the 63 most populated urban areas with five million or more inhabitants, three quarters are on or near the coast and two thirds are in Asia. In the Pacific region, most of the significant concentrations of population are adjacent to the coast. As such, climate change poses significant strategic risks for Australia and if, as the experts predict, a small rise in sea level will likely lead to a number of Pacific Island nations becoming uh, uninhabitable, uh, the dangers posed by these rising sea levels um, uh, already poses vulnerabilities uh, to these locations where they're also subject to um, tropical storms, cyclones, earthquakes and volcano eruptions. Australia's support to humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations not only makes good military sense, but is a strongly supported position within government because the role of defence in supporting HADR tasks draws strong public support. 
public support implies the need to accommodate the public information dimension of littoral operations. Um, equally, climate change is likely to impact uh, badly on fishing stocks. The southern and eastern yellowfin uh, tuna fisheries, as well as a number of shark species, are already overfished by foreign fishers, but they are also the mainstay for many Pacific island economies. When JOC conducts its Operation Solania mission, it is in support of surveillance of illegal and foreign fishing operations while working with Australian and Pacific island fishing community, um, authorities, border protection officials and other government agencies. A combined and joint military activity forms an important part of helping our neighbours protect their fragile regional economies um, in a case of one hand helping the other. But we must do more to explain the cooperative efforts uh, of such arrangements to the people of our region. In responding to HADR tasks, uh, the JOC experience points to how trusted defence has become, no longer as a force of last resort for government, uh, but one uh, that is considered during the earliest phases of considering military options that can, within a reasonable risk framework, achieve political ends for government. We only need to look at the thawing political uh, uh, relations between Australia and Fiji uh, to, uh, um, we, but with um, the visit by Prime Minister Barney Marama's visit uh, to Australia last week and the positive effect uh, that uh, Cyclone Winston's recovery efforts no doubt uh, had with Australia and New Zealand's support to Fiji. As the Navy, as Navy's maritime doctrine states, the use of forward pr uh, presence can be critical in the process of shaping events to accord with Australia's national objectives. A further positive soft power effect that can be generated from the employment of the ADS amphibious capability. The use of the ARE and ARG in military diplomacy, combined exercises with allies and partners, or both, will also the, allow the ADF to significantly improve its presence and regional awareness of its posture in the Indo-Pacific. Again, requiring more support and effort from JOC and the wider defence public affairs capability. Army's plan Bathsheba and the Chief of Defence Forces preparedness directives requires the ADF to deploy into the operating environment within days and an ARG within, uh, in less than um, 45 days while conducting regional engagement activities with the um, ARG for up to 90 days. In support and prescribed within the uh, CPD or the Chief of Defence Forces Preparedness Directive are the notice to move and preparedness requirements for the first Joint Public Affairs Unit, the ADF's sole rapid deployment public affairs organisation. This is a small 25-person unit that is already heavily taxed with operations and exercise support tasks, and it's learnt a lot since it was formed in the post-East Timor environment. But it has capacity issues, and as Defence expands its international engagement uh, activities, as directed in the 2016 Defence White Paper, so too, so too should there be a commensurate increase in the resources applied to communicate to our region and domestically. But there is little appetite for such an increase in resources, as we've recently found out with a review of military public affairs. Um, I realise that this is a contentious viewpoint, um, but we do need to face the facts. Asking more of a capability, and let's face it, it is 25 people, that is so small that it is considered unsustainable, is not going to help the ADF achieve its strategic communication objectives. And you may well uh, think, so what? Now, I contend with some... Um, uh, that I contend with some rectification, defence's reputation, the government's expectations and the public support of defence, which we have built up over the last 15 years, um, is at some risk without rectification. So let's take a closer look at two challenges within our littoral region where the military aspects of national power have dominated the strategic narrative but hold serious national security implications for our political masters, policy makers, diplomats, operations planners and importantly, for governments of our near and far neighbours. The conflict of the South China Sea, uh, or uh, the, the, um, the conflicted area of the South China Sea, offers us great insight into the challenges besetting our policy makers. And sadly, there are no easy solutions, as we've uh, since um, um, heard. The development of Australia's strategic littoral capability is seen as playing a critical part in the nation's continuing close strategic partnership with the US, which we've heard uh, quite a lot of 
um, as um, uh, Washington's announcement on the pivot or rebalance. As the US Quadrennial Defence Review 2014 notes, more will be asked of Australia and other allies to undergird the ability of the United States to face future crises and contingencies, and especially to grow partners' capacity to play a greater and even leading roles in advancing mutual, mutual security interests in our respective regions. These are all areas in which the ADF's new amphibious warfare capability has the potential to play a significant role in the Indo-Pacific region. And as stated in the 2016 Defence White Paper, Defence's international engagement is an important part of the government's approach to building international partnerships, which also includes trade, diplomacy, foreign aid and economic capacity building in a range of government and non-government sectors. But how are Australia's military objectives viewed within the region? For instance, in full view of the public, the United, a, a colonel from the United States has recently called on Australia to continue, continue to demonstrate its international right to freedom of navigation through the South China Sea, and it required the Pentagon to come out and um, correct some of his messaging, and to be more public about Australia's long-standing practice to exercise its international rights to freely transit through the region. China has countered with a cautionary note but what is at stake may be more than just our deepening military relationship with China. When it comes to the South China Sea, defence policy makers and military planners need to be aware of the importance of this sea trade route which is in which half of the world's trade passes through, valued at approximately $5 trillion. Almost a third of Australia's exports are uh, destined for China and transit through the South China Sea, trade worth $191 billion to Australia's balance of trade. According to the latest Lowy, poll in, uh, Lowy Institute poll in 2016, in a clear shift from 2014, about a third of Australians consider China as its best friend in Asia, with the Australian public more aware of this relationship over Japan, Indonesia, Singapore, India and South Korea. When asked which is more important to Australia, the relationship with the United States or the relationship with China, exactly the same number of Australians said China at 43% and the United States 43%. In 2014, only 37% nominated China as more important, with 48% nominating the US as the more important relationship. A significant majority of Australians do remain in favour of Australia conducting maritime operations in an effort to ensure freedom of navigation in the South China Sea, with only 20% against such action. Thank you. In an assessment of the news media's interest in China and, South, and the South China Sea, in the quarter from July to September this year, there were 10,784 news articles giving audiences massive opportunities to view. And according to the Icentia website, uh, 91 million newspaper opportunities, 86 million broadcast opportunities. I won't break that down for you, but it is an enormous figure based on the news media interest in the South China Sea. That equates uh, to a advertising space rate equivalent of $54 million, the space taken up by broadcast and, and print if you were to uh, allocate it to advertising of $54 million. So we're talking about an enormous volume of newsprint and broadcast time dedicated to events in the South China Sea. And if we're looking at uh, Twitter, uh, we could say that this item is now trending. But just as important as, uh, is the fact that Australia's South China Sea narrative and the nature of international relations are not the only story being told in the marketplace. We don't hold the single voice. China and Russia hold a strong bilateral military message uh, relationship, while Fiji has a look north strategy which engages both China and Russia as well as its relationships with Pacific Island nations. The Asian nations and their defence ties are also establishing new and reinforcing existing relationships. We have to be conscious and better informed about these discourses in order to understand and thereby attempt to counter any negative influence any of these narratives may have on perceptions and behaviour about Australia. To do nothing in this dynamic environment is akin to allowing adversaries to arm themselves and prepare for the next move. Manoeuvre warfare needs to occur in the physical, information and cognitive domains. Right. We won't play that, sorry. In Australia, we have our own um, complex policy dilemmas. The US Force Posture Review and the policy of rotating US Marines 
um, in Northern Australia symbolise our, our enduring deep strategic relationship with the US through the ANZUS Alliance. Exercise Northern Shield uh, was recently held as a demonstration of Australia's ability to force generate a short notice to move capability in response uh, to a security threat against Australia's oil and gas infrastructure uh, on the northwest shelf and included a deployment of a combined joint information bureau that accounts for two thirds of our total uh, one JPAU capability. And we can only mobilise one such capability brick and are looking to the single services to consider establishing a like for like organisation to at least try to build some depth into the organisation. Um, at the time of the exercise, the governments of Australia and Timor-Leste were uh, before the International Court of The Hague seeking resolution of the boundary of the Greater Sunrise oil and gas field uh, to the north of Darwin near the Timor Sea. Straight after this joint exercise, the Navy conducted its multilateral exercise, Kakadu, also in Australia's northern waters, while the Air Force has, had recently concluded um, also its major exercise, Pitch Black. The former uh, Indonesian Prime Minister, Mr Yudhiyono, told a mid-year audience at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute that as the geostrategic chessboard moves, any situation where Australia or her allies decide to deploy larger forces with considerable weapon systems and equipments, especially in northern parts of Australia, communication with Indonesia and other countries uh, remains crucial. He said it was important for Australia to maintain strategic transparency and for middle powers like Indone Indonesia and Australia, um, it was therefore important for us to promote policies that do not perpetuate any perceptions uh, of a shift in geopolitical or military state of affairs. But I do wonder, did we defence tell our counterparts in the Indonesian government and the military about these exercises? And, um, and, um, and, and that is a question that I don't have an answer for, I'm afraid. Um, I'll just uh, close off as I've had the bell uh, call now by saying, in summary, there is a significant role for communicating our national strategic narrative within the littoral region. It comes as part and parcel with the Australian government's foreign policy objectives for the region. Perhaps the uh, proposed white paper for foreign affairs would help describe in greater detail the uh, grand strategy for our region and therefore its master narrative. However, we have the defence white paper to guide us in our actions and with careful use of our public affairs resources, uh, we will continue to support defence pursue its operational and exercise objectives. Where possible, our deployable military public affairs resources will engage with and tell our story to our regional audiences while supporting our foreign affairs uh, people in posts with a broader explanation of the Australian government's investment in the region. But, however, we have to do this consciously. Assuming that the region understands the purpose of HMAS Canberra or the reasons why we exercise in Northern Australia or respond to natural disasters to help our neighbours in need um, is not a sensible assumption. It has to be executed as part of the Joint Operations Command Operational Risk Framework and within the confines of the Defence International Engagement Plan in order for it to be considered strategic and aligned. Thank you. Uh, Cameron Stewart from the Australian, if I could come to you. How did you come to write about the things you write about in the paper? Did you choose to do it? Was it part of your own interests? Or was it um, you know, something that the paper said, you look like the fellow who could write about defence, security and diplomacy? Um, well, no, there's, there's never any real science to this at that time. Um, I, uh, after my degree, worked for a DST, which was an unusual sort of uh, move, and I did that for a couple of years, and then I moved to journalism, which I think is the first person in Australia to go from an agency to, uh, to journalism. And so when Paul Kelly, our editor, finally found out about this about two years later, um, he thought it was so funny he sent me to Canberra as the Foreign Affairs and Defence writer. And from that moment, it's just sort of spread from there. And in the average week, who decides what you write? I decide almost everything that I write these days. But uh, it, it progresses when you're, when you're more junior, the editor decides. And as you get more senior, you choose your own stuff, you do investigative things. Um, uh, it's, it's a mixture of both, basically. And of the stories you write, how much do you, what proportion do you go looking for? And what proportion do the other stories brought to you? Uh, I would go looking for about 80%. There'd be about 10% that are brought to me by various people in, in the system. And there's about 10%, which is more the official engagement, if you like, with um, 
mixed media with the minister's office and things like that. So help us understand the 80% that you go looking for. What motivates you in choosing to decide to write about that as apart from that? Just what would, what would make, uh, what would be interesting to our readers, uh, what's important hopefully uh, in, the, in the debate uh, and where I think um, things might need to be tested. Uh, that, that is a very simple summary of, of what would motivate me. So is the story meant to educate or entertain? It's, it's meant to do, it's meant to educate but you meant to educate in the most entertaining manner possible. <laughs> and how difficult is it for you, so you write your stories, how difficult is it for you to actually get them in the paper? It's not difficult if we've got the story. The, uh, the, the paper is very happy to, to um, print them quite prominently. Uh, but the trouble is getting the story and making sure it's, it's accurate, making sure it's safe and making sure it, uh, you know, that you can... Um, not harm an operation, that you're protecting obviously if you've got sources, uh, and just making sure that you've, you've got it right. And that can be very hard in big organisation like defence because naturally there's a lot of uh, areas where there's a natural conservatism to, to give out information. Uh, and, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a tricky task. So on the one hand, you need to have goodwill from defence people to get information from them. But on the other hand, you're independent and you have to write what you think is right at the risk of burning up some of that goodwill. How do you make the judgment? Um, I just make it each day and I sort of get it right sometimes and not right the others. But look, I think, I think to be honest, uh, with, journal, with defence journalists, if you get it right um, you know, as much as you can, then uh, you'll find that people do talk to you. And uh, you know, so it, it's, it's generally not a problem to talk to people, but when you get into sensitive uh, areas, obviously um, intelligence, uh, submarines recently, uh, it can get quite, quite tricky. But how do you decide that something is perhaps compromising of security or it's just someone using confidentiality to hide stuff up? Well, that's actually the single most difficult question that I ask myself every day because um, you have to make a judgment as to whether the security, uh, the reason given for security reasons not to, or operational reasons not to give you information is actually to hide stuff up. And it, sadly, it is still the case that that happens for a reasonable amount. But you've got to make sure you're right on that stuff because you obviously can't put stuff out there that's going to cause you know, operational grief. And can you write about DSD with any sense of uh, integrity? Uh, no, it's very hard. I don't <laughs> think I've written about it I think once in about 20 years. Now, in terms of what you heard from both Fenn and from Mike, uh, how do you respond to the challenges that they've laid out, both internally for defence? I know it's not your job to, defel, to defend, to sell, sell defence's message, but how do you respond to Fenn saying we've got, we've got to put a message out and Mike saying we've got difficulties in doing that? Look, it's a really interesting question. I, I think um, from the media's perspective, uh, and, and can I just actually just um, perhaps that Tom was saying, can I just describe in 60 seconds what the defence media in Australia really is, because it's quite an unusual beast. Sadly, it's very, very small. I think we have a, an association which has 16 members. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Uh, there's three types of defence media. There's three types of media that covers defence in Australia. The first one is the trade magazine media, uh, and there's not many of them. And they, of course, um, cover the very narrow, important aspect. They're very knowledgeable. Um, but they will be more or less reporting in the echo chamber of the Beltway. Um, with, uh, with defence. Then there's the mainstream defence writers like myself who would report for um, the mainstream papers, the ABC, and so we would have less of a, a knowledge, a specific technical knowledge than those writers have, the trade makers, magazine writers, but uh, you know, hopefully enough to, to work the debate and, and cover it. And the third one is actually just when you're talking maybe commercial television, Channel 10, Channel 9, where you have a reporter who's simply uh, put on uh, who's doing a police story one day and next day they put on a defence story and, and with no fault of theirs but don't know the difference between the cricket and now they have to be in the southern. You know. So that, that, that's what you sort of got. And in this space, the word uh, is interesting listening to this today because uh, I could say with great confidence from my perspective um, the word littoral and the concept of littoral warfare is an absolute shock to the media. And, but this is, there's not uh, a sort of inclusion here, but it's a terrible name because most of the public don't know what it is. Uh, most 
um, journalists don't know what it is. And if you display it, it's a little bit of sea, a little bit of land, a little bit of sky. It involves the Air Force, the Navy, the Army. Um, it, uh, it goes out to an ill-determined part of the ocean. And we haven't really been involved in it in any serious way since World War II. Now, if you can sell that story, you sell the most of the Eskimos in lots of ways when it comes to the media. However, I do believe that it is really crucial, as, as Ben made a reference to, you just simply use the word amphibious in everything you do publicly with the media when you're to referring to the littoral space. Now, that's fine. I understand this, that's the proper concept. And I understand that, you know, purists say it's, that that's not apples for apples. But honestly, from the media point of view, you know, you, you, you talk about amphibious, and you're talking people's ears freak up. You know, I mean, everyone, and it does sound incredibly basic, and I know you all poo poo it properly, rightly so, but everyone has seen private, same private Ryan. They, they know about the, they read about the D Day landings, um, you know, they know the concept. Of, I mean, Hollywood has made the concept of, um, of amphibious warfare, even though that's ancient, uh, a very <coughs> known idea, you know, uh, even remember in. Um, Somalia, when they went, there, they went over there, they had that stage beach landing with the CNN recording them and things. And people just basically know that concept, and that is absolutely where um, the selling point has to be. It has to be on amphibious as much as possible. I would, this way, if I was writing a story on it, I would not write the word "withdrawal" in the paper. A Sunday editor would probably come back and say, "What's that?" So, but let me come back on that. So, couldn't the contrary argument be, be though? The more we use the word. We all, the more we explain the term, people will get it. They got amphibious from somewhere, not nowhere. Therefore, what about the argument we should persist with littoral because it is what it is. It is an amphibious. It's not Iwo Jima. Um, or do you just say, look, in terms of media management and uh, disseminating the message, sorry, you have to go with another word. Look, I would go with amphibious. I mean, D-Day landings were littoral landings. You know, I mean, I can't use that word then. Uh, I just don't think that it's a, it's a great selling point. And I think that the, one of the problems, and I say this with great disappointment, with the media in Australia and, and defence is just there isn't nearly enough uh, in volume and quality of coverage uh, already. And you just need to keep editors interested. You need to keep everyone interested in that respect. And I think that, that's a, that to emphasise the Torah as far as the selling point is a very difficult thing to do. You can still do it, but I'll put amphibious in there as much as you can. So we heard some good news about what's happening in both uh, Navy, but more broadly in the ADF. You heard the speakers this morning. What would be the two stories that you would draw from what they uh, presented as something you could sell to your editor and that the reader would get beyond the first paragraph? Oh, well, I think, I think that there's a couple of ways that um, it could be sold um, a bit better. I mean, in a way, it's a very good time to start doing this properly, um, as, as uh, Michael and been, uh, alluded to because you've got you've suddenly got these two LHDs and they are the rock stars of the Navy and, and they really I mean, as far as the media are concerned they, these I can't I can't overestimate this they are the rock star of the Navy they'll be the rock star until you know we get a new submarines in 2090 or something <laughs> basically um, you know this they, they <coughs> editors want to send um, reporters out there they want to go uh, and they want to cover what they do. I have a, a personal um, opinion on how we could much better sell, or you guys could much better sell those those ships, and that is um, the government always, the government defence always emphasised the um, the natural disaster uh, relief aspect of them, and I totally understand that. And as we've heard in our previous presentation, it's an incredibly important role. Um, but I think that there should be much more salesmanship on the war fighting aspect. Of and I feel that the defence becomes overly cautious with this sort of stuff. I mean, that's eventually that's actually why we've got the ships. And uh, and I think that um, sometimes defence has a, a natural reluctance because I think the journalists will say, well, well, what's that for? And you know, you can't kind of say, well, maybe landing on you know, or maybe helping landings on various nearby countries. You can't necessarily say that. But I just think that that if the good explanations as to their possible role in the conflict are hardly ever spoken about. And I think that's an area where it really could be solved a lot more as opposed to the, um, the disaster rescue. So it's more than a morning tea cart. 
yeah. they actually do combative things, but you think, from what you're hearing, that there are people in defence who are squeamish about this? Yeah, I, mean, I think they really like to say, look, you know, this is, this is the way it will happen. Uh, and and, uh, and if, I think if, if there was a way of, just, of explaining that to some journalists, I think they could write some pretty good stuff on it. Uh, Mike Finn, would you like to come back yeah, to uh, Cameron on any point he's made? It, and he's absolutely right. But I remember um, telling a PA worry now, uh, but 2010, 2012, we had a 60 Minutes crew. We, we engaged with them and we sent them to RIMPAC. And uh, they were, the story was, we haven't got the LHD yet, but here's Bonhomme Richard. It's a sort of like that. So what they were trying to do, what we wanted them to do, a story on the amphibious aspect. There's beautiful pictures and vision. I think Ken Imler was there. Um, First interview, we found a, a first group of soldiers, um, very seasick. Um, I think we were USS Samson, I think, and the 60 Minutes crew was very excited. Finally, they'd got all this way. And uh, I said to the soldier, gave him a quick brief. I said, look, I just want to talk about amphibious. And it's like, I didn't even know what that was at that stage, probably. But anyway, he said, oh, OK, so that's fine. The cameras are rolling, and Michael Usher goes, so how do you feel being part of such a huge exercise and he looked down the camera and he said I didn't join the army to effing go to sea <laughs> and Michael Usher looked at me and it was one of those career defining moments this could have gone either way but fortunately career defining for who well yeah that was the point and anyway eventually but 60 minutes didn't use that because that wasn't actually what they were after um, they wanted the story on the sexy amphibious stuff so he gave Michael Usher rides in all sorts of things and exactly what Cameron was saying and you know what they <laughs> I remember another career-defining moment was when DCN uh, Trevor Jones saw the ad. The first line was, at war with China. And then you had all the vision that we'd collected. <laughs> Which, in the end, look, it was the headline that, that killed us. But the, the story was actually fantastic. And it was about the sexy new capability that was coming online. We need more of those. But as I alluded to before, if we said to Cameron, mate, you just come up to Darwin for a couple of weeks, or possibly Cameron might be a bit too, too senior, but the average journalist couldn't do that. They can't afford to go to Northern Shield, let alone to the remote places that we go to. I mean, if, if Captain Sondra had been told, can you embark Cameron Stewart for um, a couple of weeks? Absolutely, we could do that. But I don't think Cameron's editor would, would have liked to see him go for, how long were you away, sir? Uh, yeah, for, for a month. But can I make yeah. a point, the fact that in the series briefly. of activities, briefly, we actually do have scheduled for the other Yeah, and And I think we'll see some of that. I'm sure that Navy comms will, uh, will, will be involved in that. But as I said before, it shouldn't just be Navy comms. It should be Army, it should be Air Force, it should be all of us working together to get a joint message across. Mike, I've just got one, one supporting comment. Um, we take the view at the moment that uh, we're uh, um, uh, competitive in the information space with our media colleagues. And I think we've just got to change our mindset. We need to be cooperative. And if there is stomach uh, within the news media to want to tell the hard-edged story about what an amphibious capability is there to do, then we have to find ways to put those actors, those news media actors, into that space. Because the best storytellers are going to be those people, not us on, on the PR side of the fence. So, you know, we've got the technology, we've got GoPro cameras, we've got uh, telecommunications technology can reach the far-flung reaches of the world. Um, all we need is uh, willpower and, uh, you know, and some um, people who are prepared to, you know, to, to do the CW Bean, uh, to do the Damien Power thing and be up there on the front line and then get them to tell a story. And that would be very powerful. Uh, that's right. I mean, one of the problems is, is money, as you said before, Tom. Uh, we media really hasn't usually got the money to get to these places. They're often, uh, you know, difficult to get to. Defence hasn't got a lot of money, but I would think uh, the best thing is to be a bit more selective about the actual um, invitations. And when you get something that is really effective, uh, dis display of amphibious warfare or something which journalists can really get something from, then maybe make an exception, talk to that uh, organisation and see if you can get them there because. You know, the payback will be there, but it's hard for us to get there. And also, we can't just go and, and do the PR pieces, you know. You've got to make it interesting for the paper, for the reader. So you need to, that's why I say about the warfare aspect, you really need to have someone to say, this is what would happen, this is what would happen, and then you can weave it into a really nice narrative. But Cameron, does it really matter that Mr and Mrs Suburban have, in the end, no idea what's going on if they'll turn up to open days 
and go away feeling good. So are you actually pitching your stories not to Mr and Mrs Suburban but to the ministerial staffers and the other people who are in the big house over the hill? Are they the only ones that matter and the, the ones you're actually pitching to? I certainly don't want to pitch to them, that's for sure. <laughs> no, no, I'd much rather pitch to the, the readers. And No, I think, I, think absolutely, I think it's crucial. I mean, these are massive money here. There's massive taxpayer dollars. I mean, it's one of the great motivations of reporting on defence is how many taxpayer dollars are put towards defence. And So there's a, a duty on, on everybody to make sure that they're, they're spent properly. Just a, um, a comment, if I could, Tom, about these, the popularity of these new rock stars, as I call them. Uh, the... I would have thought a really good idea if you wanted to um, increase the knowledge of people's... I'm talking the punters, I'm talking just people here, not the media, uh, of the amphibious ships, is simply um, to get a room when you have an open day and get one of the rooms inside one of the ships and have an absolutely fantastic video presentation that starts off in the most basic way, probably with D-Day, and starts off with the whole history of amphibious warfare in a really engaging way and then segues into Australia's role in that, in the Second World War, and then into the history, but in a really modern, interesting, informative way, and then have some wild diagram, which is very simple, but which explains these days, well, this is what, you know, you can even mention the littoral, I guess, if you really wanted, but, you know, this is how it happens in diagrams. If you're getting all these people who've come to the ship, they're interested in the first place, and give them that, I reckon that would be the cheapest, most effective way to get a really good message across to the general public about how it works. Thank you. It's been a fascinating conversation. We need to break for lunch. Would you please thank our panellists this afternoon? <laughs>